Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is our joy and our blessing to be here to worship our Father in heaven. The Lord be with you. Together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. In this season of Lent, let us remember the commandments. Hear these commandments which God has given to his people and take them to heart. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods but me. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not bow down to any graven image. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Remember the Lord's day and keep it holy. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Honour your father and mother. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not commit murder. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not commit adultery. Have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not steal. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not bear false witness. Have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not covet anything. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sin, to be our advocate in heaven and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sin in penitence and faith, firmly resolve to keep God's commandment and to live in love and peace with all men. You may sit or kneel for this time of confession. Let us confess together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sin. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, 
Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's stand to worship the Lord together. Heavenly Father, we, this morning, we come before you with an overwhelming sense of gratitude and praise. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of a new day. And as Psalm 92 says, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. Open our lips, Lord, that we may sing praises to you. Open our eyes that we may see what message you want for us. Open our hearts, Lord, to receive you. All this we pray in your holy name.
Father. Forever, you will be the Lamb upon the throne. And we gladly bow the knee to worship you alone. And even as we end this time of praise and worship, let this whole service, Lord, be a time of praise and worship to you. Amen. Let us continue our worship with the collect for the fifth Sunday of Lent. Together, merciful, most merciful God, by death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved mankind. Grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in power of his victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the scripture reading. The scripture reading this morning is taken from 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 17 to 24. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we listen to the Gospel reading. Holy Gospel is taken from St. Luke, chapter 7, reading from verse 11, and all God's people say, Glory to Christ, our Saviour. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, of the town behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow and considerably considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bear, and the bearer stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. Please be seated. Good morning to you all. It's a wonderful weekend. We have two new things in the church this weekend. One is in your pews, the new pew Bibles. So if you would like to use them in order to follow uh, chapter 7 of Luke, that would be great. And also, as you may have seen as you came in this morning, there's a big banner with the theme for the year 
praise the Lord for that too. It was prepared by or drafted by Jaden Co, one of our young adults. Let's come to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning indeed for a brand new day. We thank you for the uh, wonderful time of worshipping together where we can lift your name on high. All heaven declares the beauty of the risen Lord and your glory. Father, we pray that as we listen to your word, that your word will sink deep into our hearts and that as a response, our lives will proclaim the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Church, who are you following in life? You can see on this next uh, screen a number of faces. According to Forbes, some of them are the most influential influencer uh, in this world. I don't know any of them. Uh, I've added a few others uh, that I sort of know, not all of them, uh, actors and uh, musicians, etc., politicians even. Who are we following in life? The answer to this question can often be found in what we spend most of our time watching on our phones. Isn't that true? It can be following a personality like a famous singer, actor, influencer, or politician. It can be the kind of series like TV drama that uh, we are watching or the latest news, even on the money markets or the stock markets. When we wake up in the morning, what are we most keen to be updated about and why? I'm rather boring in all of this. I know less than half the people on this screen. I only use social media in terms of WhatsApp. No Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok. So what the U.S. is very raffled about right now about TikTok. Wouldn't have an effect on me, but I know why, uh, what's going on there. I rarely watch stuff on YouTube and don't follow any series, and I'm not gaming also. Yet I open my WhatsApp first thing in the morning, which Joanne doesn't like very much. Um, and I do it because I'm afraid that I may have missed something important in the life of our church members. Please understand, I do not want to sound holy. It's just my life, truly. So, um, but I'm asking myself the question, if people would look at what keeps me busy every day, if they would identify me as a follower of Jesus. I think they would pick up that I'm a pastor, but the two aren't necessarily the same, if you know what I mean. Who are we following in life? Our church theme for this year is in his footsteps. This means we are following Jesus through the gospel according to Luke. And we see from the middle of chapter 4, people start following Jesus. Twelve men in particular beginning to follow Jesus from chapter 5 onward. Those are his disciples. Whereas crowds, whole crowds follow him wherever he goes. A little like followers on social media these days. They just don't want to miss anything that Jesus is doing or saying. He has become a celebrity that people were following. My sermon today picks up on the topic of following. It's following the living God. And I have these points. From death to life, the 
the power and authority of Jesus and following him. So let's start with the first part from death to life. According to the passage that Reverend Calvin just read, Jesus went to a town called Nain. It's not a well-known place. If I wouldn't have to preach this sermon today, I probably wouldn't have paid too much attention to it, but it gives me an opportunity to show you where it is. You can see on the right-hand side the, uh, the map of uh, Palestine or Israel, and um, you can see that most of Jesus' movements in the first part of the gospel are in the province of Galilee, with the Sea of Galilee being a very prominent landmark. And you can see on the northern tip of the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, uh, or Capernaum, whatever you want to pronounce it. And you can see in the southwest of Galilee, his hometown Nazareth. And on the border, almost the southern border, you see the town called Nain. Um, it is about a day plus journey walking from Capernaum, where Jesus had just healed the servant of a Gentile centurion who was a friend of the Jews. Why is Jesus moving from place to place? We can find the answer to that in Luke chapter 4, verse 43, where he says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. So Jesus' main mission was to preach the good news of God's kingdom. If we see the word preach, we usually think of a person speaking publicly, like what I do now. That was certainly an important part of Jesus' ministry. <coughs> but I suggest that Jesus was showing forth the kingdom in all that he taught and did. So he was just not just preaching the kingdom of God, he was showing it forth with the miracles, with forgiveness, with compassion. All of these are attributes of God's kingdom. Most of the people, however, were following, were following him because of the miracles that he was performing. Take chapter 6, verses 17 to 19 as an example. And Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. Ian, can you just flip to the previous uh, slide, please? Uh, just to give you an idea. So this, uh, this particular um, scene happened at a mountain not too far from Nazareth in Galilee. But you can see that people came from all, all of Judea and Jerusalem, far south, and from the coastal town of Tyre and Sidon, far north. Gives you an, ex an idea how popular Jesus had become. It wasn't just the people who were naturally close to him in the vicinity, but from all over people came. With this in mind, we need to picture Jesus' entry into Nain. It says that his disciples and a large crowd was following him. And as they reached the entrance of the town, a dead body was brought out, followed by the usual procession of family, friends, and mourners. This situation was particularly tragic because the deceased is a young man 
the only son of a widow. His mother had already lost her husband, who would have been the guarantor of income and protection for her. Her hope now rested on her only son, who was probably at an age where he was already earning a living uh, for himself and his mother. But now she lost this son. Almost no hope for her unless she would become the wife of another man simply to survive. Jesus' own family might come to mind. He was not the only son of Mary, but the oldest. And by this time, it seems that Joseph was no longer around, possibly deceased. One day Jesus would be crucified and his mother would be mourning, mourning at the foot of the cross and Jesus commissions John to take care of her. The grieving widow of Nain was at a point of desperation. Jesus walks towards the dead body and the pallbearers stop immediately. It is very likely that the beer was a simple frame and that the body was simply laid on top of that simple frame and wrapped in grave cloth. There was most likely no coffin. The fact that Jesus approaches the dead body was unusual because it would defile him according to Jewish law. Yet he doesn't care about him, about himself much and about what people would think. He knows exactly what he will do as he says to the woman, do not weep. Jesus acts out of compassion for the mother and raises the young man to life. And the dead man sat up and began to speak and Jesus gave him to his mother. Happy end. Let's move then from the first point from death to life, now to the second, the power and authority of Jesus. What happened in Nain was remarkable because it is most likely the first time that Jesus brought a dead person back to life. Even in the Old Testament, accounts of somebody being raised are the absolute exception. And that is to be expected because only God has the authority over life and death. Two prophets, Elijah and Elisha, are raising children from death to life. We just heard Prof. Jeffrey reading the account of Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17. And it is very clear in both accounts that they do so through the power of prayer and that it is actually God who raises the children back to life. So it's not Elijah and Elisha who do it, but it's God who does it. There is no such evidence here in Luke. Jesus is not praying to the Father in heaven and says, please raise this child. Jesus speaks to the young man and he comes back to life. This only leaves us with one conclusion. Jesus has authority over life and death because he is God. I hope you can follow. Jesus is God very clearly. And the question that I come to later on is, is he God for us in the way we follow him? For us, this is not a surprise. Jesus was already described as the word of God in John chapter 1. From Genesis chapter 1, we know that God spoke creation into existence through his word. And creation is the cradle of all life. So we know Jesus as the author of life in creation. We also know that he died on the cross and rose again after three days. 
That's why Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 54 to 55. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? But the Jews in Jesus' time didn't know all of this. To them, Jesus is the carpenter's son turned miracle healer. They were wondering, what will he do next? But I don't think anybody would have expected this. In this sense, Jesus demonstrates his power and authority. You may remember how he demonstrated his power and authority to forgive sins in Luke chapter 5 with the paralytic. And he did demonstrate his power by healing the paralytic. No one can forgive sins but God alone. No one has authority over life and death but God alone. But Jesus is doing more here. He is proclaiming God's kingdom. So he is showing forth his identity as God and he's proclaiming the kingdom of God. In God's kingdom, there is no death, there is no sin, there is no illness. When Jesus heals, forgives, and raises people to life, he proclaims the kingdom of God. We need to see the context in Luke chapter 7. We don't have the time to read through the whole chapter, but uh, what I said earlier already is Jesus came from Capernaum where he healed the servant of a Gentile centurion. So we need to assume that this servant was near death. He didn't just catch a cold. People weren't in desperation looking for the miracle healer because he just suffered from a cold. No, he was suffering from a very, very serious illness that without Jesus' intervention would have uh, probably taken the life of the servant. And Jesus remarkably heals him from a distance. He doesn't even go near the centurion's house because the centurion shows this great faith of saying, if I'm a man in authority, if I say things, things happen. The same is true for you. And Jesus commends him for his faith. And the servant is healed the very moment. And at the end of the chapter, Jesus forgives the sin of a sinful woman, most likely a prostitute. And in the middle of the chapter, Luke tells us that disciples of John the Baptist come to Jesus to ask if he is the long-expected Messiah. And let's have a look at Jesus' answer. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Please keep that last sentence in the back of your mind. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. These two verses, especially the first part, echo the words of Luke chapter 4, verses 19, for following, where Jesus in the synagogue, reads the words of the messianic prophecy in Isaiah chapter 63. Many of you remember those words very well. And then he declares that these words are being fulfilled in him. This was the beginning of his ministry. Church, the real celebrity for the Jews during the time of Jesus would have been the Messiah. Everybody was waiting for him. He would have been worth following. What Jesus did from the moment that he read the prophecy is fulfillment 
of these words. Wherever he went, there was a display of his power and authority. He showed forth the kingdom of God and today the people of Nain were the ones who could see it with their own eyes. What happened in response? Wonderful response. Verses 16 and 17. Fear, which is in Greek the same word as awe, seized them all. And they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us. And God visited, has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. The people here in this small town and the crowd that had followed Jesus to this place were amazed and glorified God. Some shouted that a great prophet had risen, likely referring to Elijah. Others saw even clearer, God has visited his people. What a wonderful moment in the gospel. A young man lives, his mother's future is secure, and the crowd hails Jesus as God. But how long will they follow him? And will they continue to follow him, even if his teaching would become more offensive? Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. We will find the answer to this in my third point, following him. The answer from the gospel to the question, were they willing to follow him even if his teaching becomes offensive, the answer is a clear no. In John chapter 6, you may want to uh, have a look at that uh, at the later part of John chapter 6. It begins by feeding, Jesus feeding the 5,000. At night, when the disciples crossed the Sea of Galilee, Jesus walked on water and calmed the storm. The next morning, the crowds caught up with him, and Jesus taught them about the bread of heaven and that he is the bread of life. I think many of us know these passages quite well. And then Jesus said this in John chapter 6, verse 53. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. What is the result of this confronting statement? John chapter 6 verses 60 and 66. When many of his disciples heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. We need to understand when this, uh, these verses refer to the term disciple, it's not referring to the twelfth. There were many more so-called disciples of Jesus. We know that from uh, the passages where he sends his disciples out. The first passage is sending out the 12, but the second passage is talking about 70 people who are being sent out. So there was a larger group of disciples, and some of them, actually many of them, according to this, when Jesus' teaching became more confronting, they would no longer follow him. These were people that had seen God's kingdom unfold in front of their own eyes. Even on this very day when all of this happens, overnight and so previous day overnight and then this day, they saw God's kingdom unfold, but they also saw Jesus that as not being an ordinary man because no ordinary man can walk on water. Much pointed to the fact that he was the Messiah. And then Jesus begins to teach something that is entirely in line with his identity. If he declares himself being the bread of life, 
This is entirely in line with his identity. And then he says to them, you have to partake of me in order to have true life. That disrupts the life of his followers. They were used to living the life their own way. Yes, they would try to live according to the law, but for what reason? The Pharisees did so in public to be held in high regard by the people. That's why Jesus says, do what the Pharisees teach, but don't do what they do, because he knows them as hypocrites. And many of the ordinary Jews would also have followed the law so that they would not get into trouble with the religious leaders. But maybe for them, not all of them were in it with their heart. Now Jesus was beginning to make statements that was offending to both groups of people. To the Pharisees, he was basically saying, you are not the highest authority in matters of faith, I am, and you have to follow me. Unthinkable. He was the carpenter's son from Nazareth. How dare he make such an assertion? To the ordinary people, he was saying, the kingdom of God is near. I'm the Lord in this new kingdom. Get ready, leave your old ways behind and follow me. For most of them, they were quite comfortable in their old ways because they were in charge of their own life, at least when the religious authorities weren't looking. Unfortunately, nothing much has changed. Today as Christians, we confess Jesus as Lord. We sing praises to him, and that is wonderful. Unlike the Jews in Jesus' day, we know for sure that he is the Messiah. We know that he is God. We know that his death on the cross gives us forgiveness, and we love that. We know that he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, which gives us eternal life, and we love that too. We declare that we want him to return and to reign over this war-torn world and restore this horribly damaged creation. We know that Jesus is the living God. Isn't that true? That's how we declare him. Some of us would even defend the biblical truth about Jesus in our discussions with others. But what about our life? What about our life behind closed doors? Who are we following? Church, I don't want to send us on a guilt trip. But we are in the season of Lent, and I believe it is good to take stock and to change some of our ways. One of my previous vicars put it like this at the beginning of Lent, very gentle. Please use this season to stop one habit that you know is not pleasing to God. I'm sure we know more than one habit in our life that is not pleasing to God. But he said, just choose one and then replace it with one habit that draws you closer to him. Baby steps, so to say, but really a good advice. Maybe we can start with what we do on our phones every day. Instead of constantly watching stuff and endlessly playing games, which is not the case for all of us, but for some of us, it is quite a thing. Why? Don't we start a devotional app that takes us through the Bible? I know that many of you use daily devotionals, and that's great. Uh, and many of you would even do that in paper form. Nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying, as I'm looking at the use of our phones, that there are actually very good apps for Bible apps that uh, helping us in our daily devotions. And I've just highlighted two here. Um, the first on the left here, I know it's quite hard to see, um, is the Bible with Nikki and Pippa Gumbel. And it comes in three different versions. Classic, 
use and express. Express is for those of us who don't have much time. Um, it takes us through the Bible systematically. You find it in the app stores, but if you want to use it on your web browser, it's bible.app.org. And on the right-hand side is the lectionary, the Anglican lectionary online. It's been put online maybe two years ago, and uh, you can choose, this is, you can see yesterday's date, the 16th of March, and you can choose the, the language, you can choose the liturgy. Liturgy would be morning prayer, Holy Communion, evening prayer. You can choose that, and then you can choose the Bible version. And it takes you to the full liturgy, but there's also a feature that just extracts the Bible readings. Because if you read the Bible readings maybe every day for morning prayer, it also takes you through the Bible. Church, following Jesus following in his footsteps, need to change the way we live our lives. Most of us know which part of our life is not pleasing to God. As your pastor, I'm not here to point finger, but I earnestly encourage us to stop any sinful habit. If you're following a celebrity online who is putting out content that is offensive to our faith. Please stop following. Some of these people use language that is terrible. And often, more often than not, they are making fun of other people. This is so much the culture of, in America, in the Western world, even if you look at Korean shows, it's all about making, poking fun of other people. And this becomes part then of our own life. And it's so difficult because if we are being made fun of, we don't like it. If our children are bullied in school or online, meaning other people make fun of them, we really do not like it at all. But we need to realize that what we do with our phones, what we consume shapes our own language and our attitudes. I encourage us instead to renew our commitment to Jesus, even in serving him. Church, post-COVID, we have quite some difficulties to uh, have our church members serve in church. I really, really encourage you, if that was you before COVID, you would serve regularly if you would want to resume that service unto the Lord, even post-COVID. We need people to serve in Sunday school. We need people to help ushering. We need people to organize events like, for example, our next family day. If this is something you would like to do, speak to us, speak to the office team, let the office team know, and we will get in touch with you. It would be great to see those of you who haven't really started serving again to serve the Lord, not, not the pastor, not the church. You're serving the Lord and you're declaring in the way you're doing it that you're a follower, you're a follower of Jesus who is our Lord and Savior. Let us pray. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we want to lift up your name. We are so blessed by seeing in Scripture your power and authority in display. We know you as the one who has authority over death and life. And that in you, we have eternal life and we praise you for that. We want to follow you in your footsteps. And so I pray that you use this morning's word to challenge us and to encourage us to serve you 
and to follow you wholeheartedly. Lord, we pray that you have your spirit dwell in us so that your spirit will help us to overcome habits that we always wanted to overcome but find it so difficult. We commit them to the power of your spirit in our life and we pray that you help us by your power to overcome. We pray that you will set us free of those habits and that you will usher in your light into our lives, every corner of our lives, that your, our lives will be a reflection of your glory. We pray all of this in your name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, congregation, please stand. We will declare the Nicene Creed together. Together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. And on the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scripture. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for intercession. Let us sit or kneel. We come into intercession. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come together today to praise and intercede for the churches and the world, you taught us to pray not only for ourselves but for the people everywhere. Hear us as we pray together. Pray for the church. Pray for protection, guidance, strength, and wisdom upon our Archbishop Titus Chung as he leads the Diocese of Singapore, the Diocese of West Malaysia, Sabah, and Kuching, and his family and his team. We pray for empowering of the Holy Spirit upon Archbishop that he will lead with faith conviction and godly wisdom as he seeks the Lord daily to protect him with your goodness daily through the word and to the and to lead Anglican Diocese of Singapore and the work in different deaneries which will grow and bear much fruit. We pray for all vicars and clergy as they lead their parishes as they prepare for Holy Week that we will increase in our devotion to Jesus, who suffered and gave his life for us. May the Lord bless and strengthen all who labor under his majesty, mighty hand, to advance God's kingdom. Pray that God will anoint and strengthen them from his service. Pray that the Anglican Diocese to be a blessing for those in need to bring about a greater unity, to walk in his ways, to be a beacon of hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the world. We pray for God's peace to reign in the world, especially in these countries and hope 
in these challenging, turbulent times of conflict, political and economic instability. We pray and ask that the leaders of this nation will seek peace for war-torn nation, that the Lord will bring an end to the violence, hatred and in injustice. Pray for wisdom and compassion for all leaders to seek to work in unity and put away all selfish motives and to put the lives of the innocent as priority. May the Lord guide and guide the leaders and decision makers to work in unity to bring peace and recognition. We pray for open doors to allow the supply of food, clean water, medical supplies and necessities as these war-torn nations experience the sacred scarcity. We ask the Lord to bring healing to those who are suffering from violence and comfort those who have mourning the loss of the loved ones, homes are in constant fear of army invasion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Singapore. May the Lord guide and direct them with wisdom and strength to lead the nation with justice, compassion, and integrity. Pray for continuous racial and religious harmony, especially in the midst of the Israel-Hamas war. We pray for our nation, for God's continued hand, protection over Singapore. We thank God for our government and pray for our President Dharman Shamgaratnam, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong, and all those who are in the authority. May the leaders may have placed in the authority seek justice and righteous moral standards for our nation. With God's protection, they will continue to bring peace, harmony, stability, and to take the best decision for the future of our nation and benefits of the people of our country. May the Lord guide and direct them with wisdom and strength to lead the nation with justice, compassion, and integrity. We also pray for our healthcare workers that God will protect them and their families, strengthen them physically, mentally, and spiritually in dealing with the patients. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for St. Hilda's Church. We pray for wisdom, strength, and grace upon our vicar, Martin, Reverend Calvin Wee, Reverend Hong An, and their families. May God anoint wisdom, grace, and strength, fill them daily as they shepherd the church, share God's word faithfully, and render pastoral care. Grant them joy in serving and guide them as they lead the church, especially this year as we celebrate 90 years of God's faithfulness. May we, the church, grow in our love for the Lord and love for one another. And may our lives magnify and glorify the Lord that others will seek, God, seek Christ in us and through us. We pray for our pastoral and administration staff that Lord will bless and refresh them, fill them with joy and bless the works of their hands and that we find refreshment in the Lord as they seek to be faithful to the work they have been called upon into parish blessings them and with the continual protection upon them and their families. Bless them with good health. We also give thanks for many who have volunteered for the neighborhood blessing Pray that they will bring the love and light of Christ as they invite our neighbors to the Easter service. Pray for Alpha Cause as it is in the fourth week. We pray God will draw many participants seeking word of God and to minister powerfully by our leaders in the church and the lives of the individuals for the Holy Spirit to open their hearts and minds to reality and God's love. Pray that the eyes of the hearts and the participants will be awakened and they will have an encounter with the truth and living God. A moment of silence. Let's pray together for those who need prayers, who are not well, who, who are in, in the uh, dif uh, difficult time. Gracious God, we pray for those who in our community who are sick and suffering from illness, 
that they will be healed and their families be comforted. We also pray for all who are suffering in body, mind and spirit, the lonely, the bereaved. Give them courage and hope in their trouble. At this moment, we also want to lift up to you, especially uh, Pastor Alison this morning as she's been in hospital and is recovering. Continue to bless her in good health. Father, watch over her strength as she puts trust in you who has always been faithful and good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's pray together. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Peter, for leading us in time of visit session. May I just request for us also to continue to pray. Let's pray for students that will be going back, teachers will be going back for, uh, to schools as, we, uh, as they end their school holidays. Father, we want to commit, Lord, uh, every student, every teacher to you, Lord, especially the students that they will continue to be keen learners. The Lord, this opportunity to learn, Lord, to sit at the feet of uh, the teachers, Father, and the, to, Lord, be uh, um, able to absorb the knowledge. But, Lord, may they find joy, Father, in going to school and to uh, experience uh, what it means to uh, be, Lord, um, sitting, Lord, and, and also enjoying the time of uh, learning and also uh, having social life together, Lord. We pray for teachers, Lord, and principals as, uh, will be starting the, this new term. Lord, we pray you grant them uh, your strength and your knowledge and that, Lord, may you continue to grant them passion to raise up this generation to become um, good citizens of uh, this nation. We commit this to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we declare our faith, our uh, belonging to Christ. Together we declare. We are the body of Christ in one spirit. We are all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and build up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. We share the peace. Thank you. Please take your seats. Peace be with you indeed. I would like to welcome you all. Uh, I'm wondering if there's anyone among us who is here for the very first time. If that is you, you may want to just give me a short wave and uh, our ushers will provide a welcome pack. Anybody? I think we are among ourselves. Do remember to invite your friends especially uh, during uh, the season of Easter. Easter is a wonderful opportunity to invite them. Um, but before we go to the season of Easter, I would like to lead us in a short prayer uh, for, our, for those who go out for neighborhood blessing. Uh, Father, we want to thank you for those who have stepped forward to bring the invitations out into the neighborhood. We pray for your protection upon them, we pray for favor as they ring doorbells or knock doors, Lord. We pray for uh, good conversations, uh, friendly conversations, and we pray that those here in the neighborhood will remember that this church has been here for 90 years and has been a blessing to the neighborhood all along. Lord, I pray that you bring the neighbors to worshiping you in this church even. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, just looking forward to the Holy Week. Next week is Palm Sunday, and on Palm Sunday, all the services, the regular service times remain the same. We've invited Pastor Tak Meng next week to preach, which is a joy to have him back. And then on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, we have two services where I would like to especially invite you because this year being in the footsteps of Jesus, we want to make those services a little bit more experiential, if you, if you may. Uh, so for example, as we know, the Monday Thursday evening, 
happened at the time in the context of the Passover meal. So we will partake of a, of a very simple uh, meal together uh, at the first part of the service and then launch into the two things that actually happened during that meal. One is celebration of Holy Communion, one is the foot washing. And then we will have homilies uh, both on Monday, Thursday and Good Friday that sort of walk with Jesus. And on Good Friday, uh, the theme will be that we shall carry our cross. So um, do come on Monday, Thursday, 8 p.m. in Bethel Hall and Good Friday, 12 noon, also in Bethel Hall. And for Easter Sunday, you have an insert in your bulletin that you can use as an invitation card to your friends. We have services at 8 a.m. here and at 10.15 up in Bethel Hall. Both services are services where the good news of God's kingdom is being proclaimed. So bring those who you know that may need the good news of God's kingdom, even and especially if they don't know Jesus yet. And then I would like to just give you a brief reminder that until the end of this month, it would be great if you could sign up for the church camp if you haven't done so yet. We will be in Penang from the 31st of May to the 3rd of June. We already have hundred and close to 140 people going, but uh, there's still enough time and space uh, to book more rooms at the hotel. So let us know if you wanna come along and we can assist you. Let's now do the memory verse together real quick. Let's read together. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians chapter two, verse 10. Let's try it again. For we are his workmanship created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Praise the Lord. Let us now stand for our offertory. blessings. 
Christ crucified draws, draws you to himself to find in him a sure ground for faith, a firm support for hope, and assurance of sins forgiven. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Please remain standing. I have decided to follow Jesus. students and teachers going back to school.